Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Wanakism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And you can also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have, or I'm delighted and very excited to have Lawrence Reed, uh, who is the president of FEE, the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, he's a libertarian voluntarist, um, and he's on Facebook uh, as Lawrence Reed. Um, and you could also find him on Twitter at Lawrence WR. Uh, and you can uh, see all of his work, follow his uh, posts there. And so he, L Lawrence has traveled, among other things, you can check out his Wikipedia page. It's pretty extensive. Um, he's traveled to 81 countries now. Um, he's he's um, held, uh, what, what was it? Was it held hostage in, in 1986? Oh, I, I would say uh, detained might be a better word. Detained, I detained yeah. in Poland <laughs> for a few years. So that was uh, that was a fun time, I'm sure. Yeah, it sure was. I didn't know if they were going to let me out or not, but they did. Wow, I'm so grateful that they did. I'm sure, <laughs> sure a lot of people are. Um, so, so he's written a, a bunch of books. Um, uh, his recent one is called "Excuse Me, Professor: Challenging the Myths of Progressivism." And uh, he basically um, takes on head on the uh, a bunch of uh, you know myths that most statists would hurl at you, um, and he just uh, debunks them in the in the most beautiful way. So uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about that uh, among other subjects. Um, Upton Sinclair, the Jungle, uh, which which is a uh, you know supposedly indictment of capitalism, and uh, we'll talk about that. And we'll get into the Great Depression as well as uh, you know the robber barons. You hear all the time how. Um, you know, if it wasn't for government, you know, mon monopolies would destroy, you know, <laughs> the world. We'd all, we'd all be working 16 hour <laughs> days, no bathroom breaks, no vacations. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, our, our, uh, our toddlers would be in the factories with us. <laughs> <even today. laughs> right? So, That's right. right. So Lawrence, uh, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Hey, thank you, Danilo. I've been looking forward to this. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I've really heard a lot about you and, um, I was delighted when I saw, um, uh, Luis Mises uh, interview you on his Emancipated Human, and and I'm like, wow, <laughs> that is awesome! I gotta get this guy on. I've heard a lot a, about you. <laughs> we had a lot of fun that night, I recall. <laughs> yeah, yeah, beautiful. So, um, so maybe can you get into a little background before we get started um, as to how did you get involved in libertarian? I know you have a pretty extensive history, but uh, yeah, just give us a little background how you got involved in the liberty movement and uh, and then the uh, and FEE. Okay. A lot of people in the liberty movement started out as uh, socialists or interventionists of one kind or another and then moved in our direction. But uh, that's not the case with me. I was always uh, rather libertarian leaning, uh, at least anti-authoritarian. And uh, I first became active as a teenager in 1968 after the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia. I was quite uh, upset about uh, what they were doing and wanted to reach out and do something to help the Czechs and that proved to be joining a demonstration against the Soviet invasion in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It was sponsored by Young Americans for Freedom and uh, I joined that group at that time and that was my pipeline to free market uh, literature, libertarian literature and it changed my life and put me on a path to uh, advancing liberty in every way that I know how as a teacher in the classroom and now as a foundation president awesome yeah and and so eventually you um yeah you, you became president but but i'm sure you you know you've been active writing articles writing books right and giving speeches yes. and, and things like that so um yeah so please get into your your book i really want to uh you know talk about these myths that we hear all the time from people please <laughs> well it seems like half the time those of us who believe in free markets uh, we're talking about the misconceptions about freedom and free markets, the mistaken beliefs that people have. And so I decided, uh, since I'd written a lot about some of these things, to put those essays in one place, write a few new ones. And so the result is a book called Excuse Me, Professor, <laughs> subtitled uh, Challenging the Myths of Progressivism. It's got 52 chapters. And everyone uh, deals head on with uh, one of these misconceptions, such as uh, capitalism caused the Great Depression or uh, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle proved that we needed government regulation. Uh, 52 in all. And um, I could probably write four or five more books with 52 more in each of those. Wow. They, they just keep on coming. Yeah, yeah. There's no end to the logical fallacies. <laughs> that's right. Sadly, that's right. <laughs> 
you know uh, <laughs> like I, I you know like the, the the great depression um you know the intervention and also also like government intervention you know got us out of the war and or or yep. that the, that the war was actually beneficial actually because i heard yep. right the um that the hum woods is going to start a uh a podcast, a weekly podcast with Bob Murphy about, um, you know, uh, debunking Paul Kr- uh, Krugman, right? Every week, every week he makes a, a, a column. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Bob and Tom will have endless uh, material for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, it's it's amazing how when I talk to people and they and they talk about they they just, you know, mindlessly regurgitate this stuff. And I'm like, wait a minute. If you're saying that war is good, basically what you're saying is murder is good. Murder yeah, helps yeah. the economy. <laughs> yeah. Right. And of course, and you and I know that war simply diverts resources away from the things that you and I as consumers would prefer to have, uh, like uh, automobiles and refrigerators, and instead makes tanks and guns and planes. And uh, arguably, those things are needed to win a legitimate war. But don't confuse that with the idea that 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 somehow is an economic stimulus, because it isn't. It's a diversion of resources. It's a destruction Mm -hmm. of resources. Uh, and we'd be better off without wars, right? Right. <clears throat> yeah, I tell people that um, you know the, the the government it can't create wealth, right? You, you, it's That's like right. a, I, I liken it to like a, a tick. <laughs> you know, <laughs> saying the government creates wealth is like saying a tick can create blood. You know, it, it, it's a parasite, <laughs> right? It siphons off uh, p- productivity from the industrious, from the from the people who actually create value. Uh, without guns, without force, without you know uh, uh, coercion, and uh, and then they get uh, you know something attached to them called a bureaucrat, <laughs> and just yeah. sucks off you know, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a good way to put it. It's absolutely right. The most the government can do is redistribute wealth and charge you a fortune to do it, uh, and even then the end result is not something that is conducive to either health or happiness. Right, right, right. Please, uh, can you get into um, Upton Sinclair, The Jungle, and and, uh, what you wrote about that? Sure. Uh, Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle, which appeared a little over 100 years ago now, is taken as gospel in a lot of places. I I know that in public school uh, classes, I recall teachers sort of presenting it as if it was fact, that these conditions in the meatpacking plants of Chicago that Sinclair wrote about were awful, that there were people falling into the vats and being ground up into meat products and sold to the public. And, (laughs) you know, not too long ago when I started researching this, one thing I wanted to find out was, okay, who were these people who Mm. fell into the vats and were ground up into meat? Surely we could find some names. Mm. Surely there were family members or co-workers who said, hey, what happened to Bob, you know? Mm. Uh, Why didn't uh, 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 Matt come home from work? today, you know, (laughs) but uh, there were no such people. That's why uh, you won't find any monuments to them anywhere because it never happened. And that was true of much of Sinclair's book. Uh, He didn't uh, write it with the idea that this is going to be some kind of a documentary Hmm. about conditions in the meatpacking plants. He he knew almost nothing Hmm. about the meatpacking plants. This was a novel. It was a work of fiction. And its purpose was to advance a socialist agenda, which he freely admitted. So he, he, he cooked up these charges. Even Teddy Roosevelt, the president, said that the man was a notorious liar. Uh, and then today, though, it's presented as if, oh, he, he exposed these terrible conditions and it led then to the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. We had to have government regulation because the private meat packers uh, were uh, poisoning their customers, which is ridiculous, absurd on its face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, you would think if some people died in your factory, like uh, it would make headlines somewhere, you know, and you would see yeah. you would see a trail, a paper trail, right? <laughs> yeah, or the family would complain, you know, right. want to know what happened to, to dad, <laughs> but it never happened. That, oh, dad didn't come home, eh? I guess, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. I guess yeah. we'll find a new. T- <laughs> I guess we'll just have him for supper tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's uh, yeah, it's, it, and, and it's a real easy way. Like the same thing we get with the child labor laws. You know, people think that without government regulation, we would still have you know toddlers <laughs> working yeah. in factories, right? And, we, and know, that's another myth that we address in the book too. Absolutely. Yeah, and and uh, and it's funny. I remember Tom Woods made an interesting uh, argument, saying how you know a lot of the um, the factories in India. Um, uh, the, I guess because of their poverty, a lot of the children have to work in the factories, right? Because yeah. what is the alternative? Starvation or prostitution, right? So, so it, I mean, maybe to our lifestyle, 
uh, there, that working condition is, is, um, you know, obscene or, yeah. you know, it's, it's not preferable, but what is their alternative? And <laughs> when you, yeah. and when you outlaw what they're doing, then you force them into a, a lesser alternative. <laughs> Absolutely. The, either the children have to go underground and work in even worse conditions, or uh, the family is condemned to a life of extreme poverty uh, if they're able to survive in, in, in places like that. You have to go back to uh, pre-industrial days uh, and ask yourself, well, did children work before that? or did, did, Were they just dancing around the Maypole in the middle of the Middle Ages? And then uh, capitalism came along and put them to work in the mines mm -hmm. or the factories. Well, no. Children were lucky pre-industrial revolution to live to the age of five. Mm -hmm. Even Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, uh, as late as 1776, points out that the average Scottish woman uh, had 17 children and was lucky if five of them survived mm -hmm. to the age of five. Uh, so if they were lucky to survive, they worked. It was capitalism uh, that uh, allowed for the greater productivity gains of their parents that ultimately took them out of the mines and the factories, not, not, uh, not socialism or interventionist legislation. It was capitalism that made things so productive that parents in time could work, be productive enough to earn uh, uh, enough that the children didn't have to work. Right, right. And, you know, when I'm talking about these topics with people, um, it's, it's helpful to, for me, I find, to go back to the basics. You know, you know they talk about capitalism and they, and they talk about, um, you know, socialism and they talk about fascism. And, but they don't really know, like, what, wait, hold on, hold on. <laughs> How do you define <laughs> capitalism that you hate yeah. so much? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. And, they, they, and they point to Wall Street. That's capitalism. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. They think people making money, that's all it is. And if they think some are making money uh, in a nefarious way right, right. Uh, through their political connections, they don't differentiate that from real capitalism, which is honest people creating wealth for consumers and not using their political connections to get any special advantage at the expense of others. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's so difficult for people to, to see that because we live in a society that's so intertwined and intermingled with with status regulations and laws and taxation yeah. that it just distorts the um you know the the free flow of uh, of resources of capital you know and so it's really difficult to imagine what would a <laughs> you know although i mean you guys you can look at the black market right <laughs> yeah but, but yeah. Even, even that wouldn't exist without the state so that's really yeah. a, a fun, uh, you know creation of the state right yeah a lot of people have this reflexive reaction they see a problem and it doesn't occur them to, to them to ask you know, might there have been some previous government intervention that, mm. that contributed to the problem? Yeah. They just start with a problem right, and say, right. it must be the fault of free markets, and so more government is the answer, even if it was the problem in the first place. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's like, they, yeah, they start with the, the ground. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, so I, I tell them, you know, what is the definition of, of capitalism? I go to Mer Merriam Webster, Webster Dictionary, and, and, and I think it says, um, it's like the private ownership of of uh, you know of uh, factories the means of production in private individuals right no mm -hmm. mention yes. of government whatsoever and that's it and and my yeah. I, I would add to that my definition would be um, you know peaceful people engaging in voluntary interaction that's it yeah <laughs> that's yeah it. that's right yeah no sp uh, special favors right. privileges immunities subsidies from government at all right. Yeah, yeah, and then you ask the person, "Are you against that?" <laughs> Peaceful people engaging in voluntary. <laughs> How can you be against that? You know and exactly. If and if you are, you're you're for you support involuntary interactions or theft or assault or you know anything that's a uh, that's you know a win lose scenario. That's right. The the initiation of force in right. some way. Right, right, right. Exactly. Um, so, so can you can you go into a little bit of the uh, the uh, the myth about the Great Depression and how you know? Thank God for FDR and his New Deal. He just lifted us. He like a like a like an <laughs> a, like a savior. You know. <laughs> thank, God, uh, I, thank thank God for his pen. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he just did it with a wave of his wand or right. his pen. Uh, I, I'm delighted that you raised this because it's one of my favorite topics. The, the general misconception is that free markets failed us in 1929 and that uh, Herbert Hoover, the president then, was a stand pat, laissez-faire, do-nothing president and that uh, Franklin Roosevelt had to come in and uh, uh, intervene in the economy uh, to spur recovery. All of that is total bunk. Uh, you have to look back and ask yourself, well, what preceded the stock market collapse and the coming of the depression before 1929? Well, you had 
uh, the Federal Reserve System, which is a government creation created by the Congress uh, that had inflated the money supply, uh, drove interest rates to record lows for five years in a row from 1924 to 1929. It spawned this uh, artificial boom, uh, the roaring 20s, we call it. It was easy money stuff, interest rates at historic lows. There was a land boom in Florida. It sounds a lot like uh, just a few years ago before the big bust of 2008. Uh, so you had the Federal Reserve stoking the fires with easy money, uh, but then the Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve, changed policy uh, around the end of 1928 into early 29 and started raising interest rates, choking off the growth in the money supply. They first had expanded money and credit over that previous five years by like 60, 65%. And now from 29 until 1933, they contracted the money supply by about a third. So the economy went through this cycle because that's what monetary policy was doing. Mm. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, that explains the start of the Great Depression, but not why it was so deep and lasted so long. Uh, that was because of other interventions that were undertaken starting in 1930. In the spring of 1930, uh, after the stock market crash the previous October, you didn't have a depression yet. You just had a recession. You had unemployment only at 8.5% uh, at a stock market that had crashed but had regained half of the ground that it had lost. What took us from a recession in 1930 and to a Great Depression quickly was an act of Congress, the Smoot-Hawley tariff that raised tariffs, taxes on imported goods, to an all-time high and almost closed the borders. Uh, and foreign countries retaliated. They raised their tariffs on American goods. And so you had governments piling on and taking a recession and making it a depression. And then in 1932, uh, uh, Herbert Hoover, still president, he uh, doubles the income tax in the midst of a depression. He doubles the income tax. The top rate was raised from 24 to 65 percent in an effort to try to boost federal revenue uh, at the expense of the uh, depressed economy. That only made things worse. And then finally, when Roosevelt came in in 1933, he prolonged the depression by about seven years because of ridiculous interventions one after the other. Uh, we can talk about those if you'd like. What yeah, caused please. the... Okay. Well, in 1933, uh, he became president, Franklin Roosevelt, and he started the New Deal. And two of the most destructive aspects of the New Deal were the National Industrial Recovery Act, which imposed uh, price controls, uh, codes, regulations on businesses that raised the cost of doing business by about 40% on average. There was even a man, a famous case of a man named Jack Magid. He was a tailor. And he was prosecuted under the NIRA because he pressed a suit of clothes for 35 cents instead of the required price of 40 cents. Now, get this. You're in the midst of a depression. You're lucky if you got a suit of clothes, you know, to, to be pressed. Here's a guy who says, I'll do it for you for 35 cents. And the government goes after him because he didn't charge you more, 40 cents. This was the government trying to raise prices by decree, right. which was ridiculous. And then in agriculture, it did even worse. They passed the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and that put a new tax on agricultural processors. Now, keep in mind, farming is in terrible shape by 1933. Mm -hmm. Agriculture is in awful depression, one of the hardest hit sectors of the economy. When Smoot Hawley, that tariff I told you about, uh, was passed, it destroyed a big chunk of overseas markets uh, for American farmers. So they're in terrible shape. So Roosevelt says, well, let's, let's uh, destroy supply and uh, let's put a new tax on agriculture and we'll use the money to pay for the destruction of perfectly good fields of corn, wheat, and cotton and, and the, the slaughter of perfectly good cattle, sheep, and pigs uh, and then keeping them off the market. Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace, in a single order, ordered the destruction of six million baby pigs <laughs> un under this uh, stupid legislation. Well, the Supreme Court uh, saved us from that because for about a year and a half, those two uh, laws and other uh, uh, stupid interventions were making things worse until the Supreme Court declared them unconstitutional in uh, 1935 and 36. So then we start to see some recovery in the economy. 
1937 comes along and we get another collapse, a depression within a depression. Mm -hmm. And that's because in that year, fresh from re-election, Roosevelt starts uh, jacking up taxes. He came into office, you know, in 1932, attacking Hoover for raising income taxes. But now that he's president, he's going to raise them to all-time highs. He took the top rate from Hoover, which was 73%, made it 91%, just the opposite of what he said he would do. <laughs> uh, so he's raising taxes. Uh, they passed the uh, Wagner Act in 1935, scheduled to take effect in 37, which gave enormous powers uh, to organized labor. And uh, armed with those powers, organized labor went on a uh, strike spree in 1937, closing factories across the country, sit-down strikes in the auto plants. Uh, the number of man hours lost uh, to strikes uh, in one year's time, 37 to 38, doubled from 14 million man hours to about 30 million, hmm. uh, thanks to that stupid act of, of Roosevelt and the Congress. So we kind of limp along through the 30s, uh, still in depression, and it's not until World War II comes along that at least the unemployment rate falls. And so some people mistakenly think, ah, it was the war then that saved us. <laughs> well, not really. Uh, the standard of living did not improve during the war years. What did improve was the unemployment rate because we drafted 11 million men, sent them to Europe and Asia, and didn't count them any longer in the unemployment statistics. <laughs> we, don't, we didn't really get uh, uh, an uh, improvement in the general economy until after the war. And when uh, government spending came down and tax rates uh, start to come down, the corporate income tax rate under Harry Truman, uh, the year the war ended, fell from a high of 90 percent to 38 percent. So you get recovery when we start backing off, uh, when government backs off the economy, but not uh, we didn't until it uh, until it backed off. Wow. <laughs> There's a lot I can say with that. Yeah, I remember uh, reading about FDR, how, like, at first, when, when I started getting into volunteerism and, and um, you know, learning about free markets, I I really thought that Obama was a, a pretty, um, how do you say, interventionist president with all of his executive orders. And uh, the last time I checked, I'm not sure, it was probably like 180 or something or 200 executive orders he's done. Yeah. But, <clears throat> and then it came to my attention that FDR like he pales in comparison to FDR, right? <laughs> I think FDR yeah. he he averaged like one executive order every other day. Yeah, even <laughs> even the uh, seizure of of your gold coins right, was right, done right, right, right. executive order. It was in right. April of 1933. Right. He said within you had less than a month. Roosevelt said every American has to turn in. This is by executive order, not by act of Congress. You have to turn in right. to the government your gold coin, your bullion. Uh, under penalty of 10 years in prison or $10,000 fine, right. just by presidential decree. Yeah, yeah, and I guess he's not a dictator, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and actually another thing I'd like to point out to people is, um, like, you know, the alcohol prohibition, you know, times, so people were, uh, you know, it was illegal, right, for, I yeah. guess, distilling and, and purchasing of alcohol, and gold was legal, right? But then, then yeah. that, I think, was it, so 1933, so, so that year, I guess, or, or the following year, it was illegal, right? And, and legal right. for gold. And then the following year, is completely switched. <laughs> legal yeah, for yeah. Gold, uh, illegal for gold. <laughs> yeah, if you had two guys walking down the street in 1933, <laughs> one of them with a gold coin in his pocket and the other one with a bottle of booze in his hand, the one with the booze was the crook. Right. And the, and the guy with the gold was an honest man. A year later, it was just the opposite. The, right. You have to give Roosevelt credit for one thing. He did push to end prohibition, but... Uh, sometimes I think that was because he probably stopped and realized that all this garbage he was imposing on the economy meant that the American people needed a good drink. And so he, <laughs> he, he pushed for uh, abolition of prohibition. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean that and then uh, the Federal Reserve. That's another great topic I, I like to get into with people because um, nobody knows what the Federal Reserve is at all. Like, they just... I don't even think they even look at their dollar bills when they use it. Like I'm like, do you even know that the Federal Reserve has actually written on the dollar? And, yeah. And people are surprised at that. And then and, and I go further. Do you know what the Federal Reserve is? No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Few people do. 
Yeah. And 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 so that's one of the one of the major uh, like when I talk to people about um, you know uh, precious metals and and uh, free markets, I s- usually start with talking about the monetary system and how yeah. precious metals you know were once a part of our of our um, currency and why is it not a part of our currency anymore and th- and that's a good story kind of a backdoor entry into uh, libertarian thought and you know free markets because you know when you start outright attacking. Um, government, a lot of people get defensive and emotional, right? And they yeah. retaliate. But when you start talking about the monetary system, no, not many people have an opinion on gold and silver. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, but you know, uh, I can't think of another agency of the federal government that has more disastrously right. failed uh, the promises made for it. <laughs> uh, it's only been around 100 years, right. but we were told when it was founded or thereafter right. that it would iron out the business cycle. <laughs> it would guarantee the security and, and stability of the dollar, that it would uh, provide just the right amount of money. Well, here we are 100 years later, and uh, the, under the Federal Reserve, we've had the greatest of our depressions, which even the previous head of the Fed, Mr. Bernanke, publicly said, yeah, we caused it. We, it was our right, mistakes. Right. Yeah. In the We've had a Great Depression, about 10 recessions, each of which was brought on by their <laughs> easy money followed by hard, uh, uh, tight money, mm-hmm. uh, and a dollar that's worth a nickel of what it was when they were started. Now, to me, that screams failure, <laughs> but nobody seems interested in getting rid of it except uh, we libertarians and vol- voluntarists. Yeah, yeah, like I, um, yeah, I, I talk, I can talk a lot about gold and silver. I've really researched that. That's a fascinating topic to me. Like, you know, um, you know, what, what is the difference between a, a, a forced currency and a, um, like a voluntary currency, you know, like, you yeah. know, right? Like, um, you know, all fiat monies are all forced, right? Legal tender by law, yeah. you know, arbitrary decree. And then you have the arbitrary currencies like, you know, like shells and beads and, you know, copper and cigarettes and lumber and, and mm-hmm. all these things were used as currency, but abandoned for whatever reason. But they're all used voluntarily because people tried them and just, you know, you, thought, you know, and then eventually the market discovered gold and silver. And for, you know, at least three, four thousand years, there has not been a, a, a more superb um, currency. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, if government is going to grow like it has in America, if it's going to go down the welfare state path, it's going to make war on sound money because uh, sound money means that they can't spend more than what they take in. Uh, but uh, it basically reduces to this. The govern- governments of the world don't like gold mm. because they can't print it. Right. Yeah. I, I, yeah. One thing I like to tell people is, uh, is um, you know, how much, how, much, how much do you think it takes to print um, store and transport uh, a one dollar bill, right? And I remember reading it's approximately six cents, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then, how much do you think it takes to print, store, and transport a hundred dollar bill? Yeah. <laughs> About seven cents, because the extra zeros require a little bit more ink, <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's and, the only difference. And then, yeah. and then, and then they they look at me in shock, like, "What? That's all it's worth? <laughs> yeah, it's just paper and ink. That's it." And, and then, and then how? And then how? How, so how easy is it to make that? You know, just printing press, or even now, you know, they just digitally, <laughs> you know, do it. But how about gold and silver? How do you create gold and silver? Okay, we mine it, but how is it created, right? So two ways that I know of is um, the collision of two neutron stars and a supernova. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think the Fed does it that way. <laughs> yeah. So you can imagine, you can imagine that the government wouldn't like gold <laughs> because they can't control those things <laughs> exactly exactly and it's never been an exception to this every welfare state sooner or later abandons sound money because politicians want to spend more than they've got and manufacture money to help accommodate their spendthrift ways and their incredible debt that they pile up to pay for the stuff right right i mean it's like you know once once a country or, or a government hijacks the money supply it's downhill from there, and that's where the you know that's where the, where the real the true control is. You know, we can talk about laws and regulations, but once they control the money supply, that's like the lifeblood of an economy, yeah. and they have complete control from then on. You know, they can print at will and bail out and and you know give favors and <laughs> subsidize yeah, yeah. and you know. <laughs> well, uh, Danilo, I can tell that you like to use good analogies to help educate people. The one I often use when it comes to money is I just try to get people to realize how absurd it would be if somebody said, well, let's have seven people appointed by the president uh, put in charge of regulating the supply of 
take your pick of the commodities, say green beans. Okay, we're gonna have a green bean board and these seven guys are gonna decide how many green beans there ought to be. Well, we laugh at that. We say, how would they know? But the market knows. Right. And so the market's in charge and you never have to worry about there being a shortage or a surplus of green beans. Uh, money's the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, does, how does seven people appointed by the president uh, to constituting the Board of Governors of the Fed, how do they possibly know what the proper supply of money should be? We ought to be frightened at the very thought that seven people think they know such things. They don't know. They don't know what the supply of green beans ought to be, let alone money for an economy of 320 million people. Right, right. And and, uh, and one interesting thing I remember reading in um, uh, What Has Government Done to Our Money, right, Murray Rothbard, mm-hmm. is um, it doesn't matter because everyone's always saying like, like you know, you know, you, you look on these uh, Fox and, and CBS and NBC, and and they say, you know, uh, if we just reach one percent, two percent inflation, you know, we're good. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> as if as if inflation is normal. As if yeah, it's yeah. just an everyday fact of life, right? Yeah. But when you have to realize, wait a minute, what is inflation? Define it. That's what. That's the other thing I tell. Define inflation. They say rising prices. No, <laughs> that's the yeah. effect. The cause is increasing the money supply, <laughs> and so therefore, as a result, it steals value from savers from people who have the currency so it's theft they're stealing yeah. your ma- their value without actually stealing physically stealing your money they're stealing the purchasing power you're absolutely right so w- when janet yellen at the fed says that uh, they have a target for in- for inflation <laughs> they want to get it they want to get it up to about two percent another way of saying that is she wants to destroy your savings at the rate of two percent a year she wants to erode the value of your medium of exchange and of your wages by 2% a year. What, why is that virtuous? <laughs> right. right. And, and so, yeah, this is what I was going to say is, is um, you know, it doesn't matter really. Fundamentally, it doesn't matter how much, how many units of any currency is in the society because regardless, it doesn't matter if, it, I mean, it, let's say it's, it's, it's stationary. It doesn't increase and the people, the population increases. So that means everyone's value of, of their currency increases, you know, in proportion to that. And so um, I remember Mike Maloney from goldsilver.com. He was saying that, um, if if we could have just one gold coin, right, in a vault, all these cameras on it, you know, guards guarding it, one gold coin, and we could uh, we could theoretically put a serial number on each atom of the gold yeah. coin, <laughs> and we it could, would be that's all you need, and that would be a wonderful, you know, I- impossible to be counterfeited, it was finite supply. <laughs> Well, you've hit the nail on the head. This is an enduring lesson of monetary economics that people don't understand. Once the market has selected a commodity to serve as money, gold, silver, uh, it's utterly irrelevant what the quantity is. A relatively small quantity of the money substance simply means that prices uh, or that goods will trade at relatively low prices. A relatively large quantity of the stuff simply means that goods will trade at relatively high prices. So as long as prices are free to reflect whatever the supply and demand of goods may be on the one hand and that of money on the other, it will adjust uh, to a price level, so to speak, that reflects those conditions. Right, right. And, and another interesting thing I notice is, um, you know, in movies, popular movies, you know, Hollywood movies, um, if, you see, if you see a movie that like features a bank heist, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> most of the time what they're stealing is paper. Yeah. <laughs> right? And, Federal it would be good if it would be good if they went out and had a bonfire because uh, uh, all, all the other money that you and I have in our pockets would suddenly be worth a little bit more. Right. <laughs> and and what, what's funny about that is, I mean, very very rarely you would see a bank a heist movie that actually features people stealing gold bars. Very <laughs> rarely, right. right? Most of the time. So that to, to me that reflects the societal understanding that paper is money. Right. Yeah. Notes are money, not not anything hard or, you know, hard currency or something that cannot be counterfeited, but something that can be printed at will by a, mm-hmm. a government agency. That's money. That's what we should revere. That's what's on the cover of magazines. That's what everybody's lusting after. And it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people are really mixed up when it comes to money. Uh, I like to point out, too, that under a gold standard, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the only thing that circulates in our pockets as money are bits of metal. Mm. Pe- people may prefer paper, but mm. they, they, there's, there's a connection between that paper and the real money substance. You can redeem or convert uh, the paper into gold or silver on demand. That's what we used to have. But uh, oftentimes people, if they know the, the paper is as good as gold, mm. they'll use the paper. But you abandon the gold and sooner or later people will, uh, will flee uh, from, from unbacked paper. 
Yeah, I uh, one one of the one of the eye opening and lightning books that I read when I first started researching all this stuff is um, Creature from Jekyll Island. Right? Oh yeah, G. Eustace Griffin. Mullins. Uh, or, oh. oh, that's right. Yeah, no, you're yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. G. Edward Griffin. Yeah. And he, oh my God! I remember when I was reading that, I would call my family members like, "Do you know that there's four four types of money, or four uh, like evolutions of money? You know, first you have um, commodity, then receipt, then fractional, then um, then paper, right? Yeah, or <laughs> and, fiat, or, or uh -huh. fiat. Yeah, right, fiat. And I'm like, wow, I didn't think about it like that. Is this this? It's an evolution, right? <laughs> and, and just like you said, but then then the only thing um, that you know, the other thing I would say is is um, you know, even if in a voluntary society, let's say a stateless society, they still choose to use the paper, it's not the same as fiat because the fiat is forced by decree, and That's the right. and the and the um, you know the paper backed by gold is voluntarily used by the mm -hmm. people. That's right. Well, uh, you mean your your government schools didn't teach you that? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't give you both sides, even. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I um actually uh, talking about government schools. I, I I remember learning in my economics class um, um two things right two things that really stayed with me. Uh, the first one um was he said Alan Greenspan is the most powerful man in the world, mm -hmm. and I did not know who Alan Greenspan was at that time. Even years after that, I still didn't know until I started studying um you know Austrian economics and I realized wow <laughs> he was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't get to vote for him, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, the, the unelected, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's amazing. And and the other thing he talked about, um, he talked about supply and demand, and he had a great a great um, analogy. He's you know because it was seventh period, so it was the last it was the last period of the day, and so and so it was after lunchtime, right? And he asked, did anybody not have lunch? Right, one kid raised his hand and he said, okay, over there is a box of donuts. Eat as many as you can. <laughs> and, then, and then and then like like uh, 15 minutes later he, he asked the kid all right the first donut how good was it scale of one to ten and he's like oh it was awesome it was a nine and then of course as as, as the donuts went you know he's like oh the second one oh not as good <laughs> <laughs> we call right? we call we call that the law of diminishing marginal utility, right? It, and it applies to money as it does to anything else. Excellent, excellent. I mean, I mean, it was a great analogy. It stuck with me all these years. <laughs> um, it's yeah. So I, uh, you know, economics. That's another great topic I'd like to talk to people about because. Um, you know, it's not, it's not like, uh, it's not emotionally charged. Like when you talk about immigration, that's emotionally charged. You know, we talk about, you know, the war on terror, emotionally charged. You talk about, you know, all, any of these kinds of things, um, minimum wage, emotionally charged, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, you know, when you talk about basic economics, like that's just human action. That's what people are incentivized to do. How can you, <laughs> how can yeah. you hate that or argue it? Right? <laughs> well, one of the, uh, crucial differences between, a free market or capitalism and socialism is that capitalism, free markets, is what happens when you leave people alone. Right. They find ways to specialize, they trade, they exchange, they invest, they build enterprises. Socialism, which has no theory of wealth creation, whatever, it's only a theory of wealth redistribution, mm. uh, uh, that's a contrivance. It has to be cooked up mm. uh, uh, by somebody in usually academia. Uh, somebody who's not well grounded in reality and is insulated, isolated, probably tenured, mm. and is cooking up plans for other people that they want to impose upon them by force. Right. That's totally different than a free market, which is what happens when you simply respect life and property and leave productive, peaceful people alone. Right. Right. I remember uh, I, I saw a John Stossel video on the um, you know how uh, Soviet Union was and how how um, strictly they try to micromanage each industry. Like how many shoes should yeah. each person have and how many shoes should the factory make and how, what size should, should they make? Oh, I mean, entire books and <laughs> volumes have been written by socialists, you know, trying to explain here's how, it's, how you should do it. <laughs> but it's laughably preposterous to think that a handful of commissars would know <laughs> such, such thing. Uh, one of my favorite quotes from Hayek, uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Austrian economist is that uh, the curious task of economics is to convince men of, um, oh, let me get it right, is to convince men uh, of how impossible it is to 
Oh shoot! Isn't that awful? No, I I know which one you're talking about. Of uh, what they they can imagine, something like that. That's yeah, uh, how difficult it is to 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 do what they imagine they can design, something, something like that. Like that's that. that's, right, that's right. close. Yeah. Right. In other words, he was he was saying, quit making out like you're some kind of a god and you know <laughs> such things. The the market will guide us, but not a handful of politically appointed, uh, short sighted right. po- commissars. Right. Yeah, so so you know when I when I tell people that you know we have to um, we have to trust in the market. Right? To me, it, I, I can imagine other people looking at that, saying that you know what, that sounds exactly like what I'm saying. I'm saying Obama can solve everything. I'm saying the government can solve everything. You're just saying the market can solve everything. So what's the difference, right? <laughs> We're all putting our faith in just like a god. <laughs> <laughs> the difference is the same difference between the Girl Scouts selling cookies, and you getting to choose whether you want to buy them or not. Right. And Al Capone shooting <laughs> up the streets of Chicago, uh, and making sure you buy booze from from him. I mean, that's the difference. It's 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 the initiation of force. Government right. is force, right. legalized force. Markets are peaceful, voluntary, mutually beneficial interaction. Right, right, yeah, yeah. The different the difference is um, well, well. When I say the market, yeah, to me, I can I can see how some people would say, well, you know, that's just that's just a you know an entity. It's no, it's you know, it's it's non corporeal. It just doesn't exist. It's out the out in the ether. Well, what is the market exactly? It's just individuals trading. That's it. Yeah. So basically, yeah. when we say the market, we say we don't know everything. We we don't have all the answers. But just let people trade, and they can you know um, pursue their own self interests and, yeah. and in a, in a strange and, and magnificent way that will actually increase the wealth and increase the standard of living for everybody. <laughs> yeah. And, and while at the same time, centrally planned systems where you've got commissars in charge and they're told, or they tell others what to do, they're all flops. <laughs> Meantime, the, the miracle of the market is, is happening before our very eyes every moment of every day. No mastermind, right, right. no top-down mandates, no emperor decreeing things. Right. It just happens because you and I engage in trade and commerce and, and activities uh, peacefully with other people. And, and the other funny thing is when, when people like uh, really attack capitalism and free markets and you know say you know warlords would take over, monopolies would, would run rampant, it's funny because it was really the um, you know the free enterprise and people creating and increasing the standard of living and creating so much wealth in society that we have the leisure to criticize <laughs> capitalism. Yeah, that's <laughs> because, right. Because Otherwise, we're not working in sixteen-hour days. <laughs> in pre-capitalist uh, feudal times, yeah, we were burning the candle at both ends <laughs> and had no time to deal with such silliness. We had to work practically 24 seven because that's what the Lord of the manor told us to do. Right. And, uh, and we barely eked out an existence for centuries. Right. And, and the other thing that's uh, that's uh, very important to point out to people is, is that at every, every stage in history, um, that is the, the best time to live. <laughs> right. Right. It's always the best time to live. So, but we, we look back in history and like, you know, those people were savages. They were barbarian. How could they live that way? You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and I think the people in like 100 years from now, they're going to look back at us and say, you know what? Those people, they had to actually type. Yeah. <laughs> they had to talk. <laughs> How could they live that way? That's right. And I hope that in 100 years, people will look back and say, can you believe those people and 2015 still allowed their government to assign their kids to the school they had to attend by their zip code. Can you believe that? Can you believe that government actually confiscated people's gold and silver, gave them pa- worthless paper in exchange, and called it progress? I mean, we'll laugh at some of this stuff that we've right. endured in our lifetimes. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I saw a great, con- uh, a great uh, cartoon of these uh, these aliens. They just visited the Earth, and then <laughs> an alien saying to the other, "They're just robbing from each other, and they're calling it." Like the economy or taxes, but it's just rob- they're just robbing from each other. <laughs> What's wrong with them? <laughs> but, but please, before we go, can you uh, get into a little bit about the the robber barons and you know the whole oh, myth sure. about you know um, if if it wasn't for the uh, what was it Teddy Roosevelt breaking up the uh, the you know the the, the, yeah. the money trust and the steel trust you know you know we would be living in uh, you know 
in poverty and <laughs> absolutely you know uh, uh, there are uh, two or three chapters in the book that deal with this by the way the, the uh, excuse me professor book so I would ur urge readers to look that up one chapter deals with John D Rockefeller who's the number one boogeyman you know uh, uh, in statist uh, history the way statists look back at our history they say John D Rockefeller made a fortune in oil and that was evil but you know he he cut the price of kerosene, which was his principal product, from about 40 cents a gallon to three cents a gallon. He didn't restrict output. He massively increased output, sold all over the world, improved the quality of the product, brought down the price to a fraction of what it was. But, you know, he made a, he made a, a lot of money off of that. Mm. But he made a lot of other people a lot uh, better off. And today, so many people just write that off. There, I think there's a lot of envy when it comes to looking back on the so-called robber barons. They don't like the fact that men became rich because uh, they serve customers. Oh, no, they, they, right, they right. did it because of their greed. Right. Um, uh, I sometimes wonder why we allow the left to get away with these bumper stickers. You know, uh, they can spout off a, a myth in about 10 seconds, mm. and we have to respond with all the details, all the homework that they didn't do. With an entire essay. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> but there's so many fallacies involved in the antitrust laws. Uh, the very first one simply said it was a crime to uh, monopolize an industry, but it didn't define what that is. W what about a company that does a job so well it gets 80% of the market and let's suppose it has uh, a new invention that if it puts on the market, it'll suddenly please consumers so widely that uh, they might sell 90% of the market. Do you want them to hold back and not mm -hmm. do that mm -hmm. at, uh, to benefit consumers because they might, quote, monopolize the market? Uh, <laughs> sometimes I hardly know where to begin with these robber baron myths, but uh, <laughs> I certainly urge people to give the book a look and they'll see some responses. Uh, another good book on the subject is a classic uh, written 30 years ago by Burton Folsom, F-O-L-S-O-M, entitled The Myth of the Robber Barons. And uh, it is a wonderful, entertaining read. And it goes through industry after industry, uh, mostly in the late 19th century, and shows that so many charges against them are just quicksand. They're not the mythology, bumper stickers, uh, but they're powerful nonetheless. Yeah, yeah, like, um, I, I, yeah, when I talk to my mother, we'll, we'll wrap up quick, um, but uh, w when I talk to my mother about these things, because she's a diehard socialist, <laughs> and she brings this up a lot about the robber barons, the monopolists, and all that, and and she's like, you know, don't, how could you support these? They're destroying their competitors. I'm like, well, I mean, if, if they're really serving the customer, right, and the people are mm -hmm. buying it voluntarily because they have a superior product, I think... They should deserve. They deserve that success. Like that's the that's the um, y y you know that's the prize for investing and for creating a business that is not easy to create, right? Yeah. And creating a successful yeah. business, putting their their money on the line, putting their neck on the line. I think that's a worthy. Uh, I think that's a worthy prize, and I don't. Yeah, I don't hold anything against them. If if the, you know they didn't. You know, if ho hopefully <laughs> they didn't use any government you know subsidies or favoritism or or. Um, or um, you know um, any loopholes, things like that. But yeah. uh, but then again, I guess t today the big the big corporations today, I guess we consider the um, the crony corporations have massively <clears throat> utilized those subsidies and tax breaks and things like that to to get you know and, and, and raise the ba um, the barrier to entry for smaller businesses to you know impossible to compete with them and things like that. So well, ask your mother, would she be happier with an economy where we didn't let anybody? Uh, uh, a win in the competitive battle with anybody else. What, what if we conducted horse races that way? Or say, <laughs> uh, Olympic Games, if we said, oh, we can't let anybody win, uh, because <laughs> right. that means somebody has to lose. But the fact is, in a dynamic economy that's ever-changing because consumers' preferences are changing, mm. you're going to have industries replacing industries. Uh, if we had said uh, to the old uh, buggy industry, that, oh, we can't let any of you guys go out of business, uh, and yet this automobile thing is going to throw you out of work. Right, so let's right. prevent the automobiles from coming along. Right. We might have saved a few buggy jobs, but we would have <laughs> prevented a lot more automobile jobs and higher standards of living as well. Right. Oh, yeah. I, I, I bring that, that ex example up a lot. You know, what, 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 what if the government decided to subsidize the horse and buggy industry at the expense of the automobile industry, <laughs> just, like, just like they did the big banks, right? What, what, where would we be? And, and that's, the, you know, that's, that's diverting resources to the most inefficient 
um, and uh, and poor use of or poor management of those resources, and that yep. you know people will suffer in general. Just pick up a 1910 Sears catalog. You can still get them on uh, eBay, and look at the things that were being sold in 1910. Most of which uh, were made by companies that no longer exist. They they were replaced by new products, new companies, new technologies. They all went out of business, and it's a different world today than it was uh, back in those times. And that's good for all of us. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, Lawrence, thank you very much. I really appreciate the conversation. Um, so please, can you give uh, the readers uh, some links and how they can contact you or, or follow your work? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, the website of my organization, the Foundation for Economic Education, is easy to remember. It's fee.org, fee.org. Uh, there, if you want to reach me, uh, you'll find my email address, but it's also lreed, L-R-E-E-D, at fee, F-E-E, dot org. So check our website out. Drop me a note if I can leave any help. Excellent. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the conversation. I, um, I've heard a lot about you. I'm delighted I'm able to get the chance to speak with you. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Danilo. Appreciate it. Yeah, so this is... Um, so if anybody wants to donate uh, to my show, help us out. Um, you can donate Bitcoin, PayPal, or Patreon. We have the links below. Uh, help us out. This is a labor of love. I love doing it. And, um, you know, it's always nice to have some monetary support. <laughs> that, and that, that, I, I'd like to second that recommendation and urge your supporters to, to, to do that because I know these things cost money. Yeah, yeah, money and uh, <laughs> you know, my wife, she's always saying, what are you doing? This is not making us money. Why do you keep doing this? <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> it's the cause. Right, you know, I mean, um, I, I, it's like, for me, it's like a snapshot in history, you know, and, and I'm recording my thoughts and, and yeah, I'm just, you're just putting your voice out there. You know, I, I think the more people put their voice, you know, either through writing, through video, through podcasting, you know, the more voices for liberty, the more we can criticize or, or um, you know, put you know, these wretched and inefficient <laughs> government uh, uh, laws and regulations on the stand and, and expose them, right, to the sunlight of, uh, of, uh, <clears throat> of logic and reason, the more, I think, you know, we will contribute to greater wealth and uh, increased standard of living. So, uh, very, uh, very well said. <laughs> and uh, these ideas are critically important. You're a hero for advancing them. And to your uh, viewers, I want to say, send this guy a check. Or, <laughs> Thank you very or much. Or Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <clears throat> so thanks, everyone, uh, for listening. This is um, Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. And you can also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. <laughs>